Hey, today, and by the way, I'm not preaching today. I'm preaching next week. I haven't preached in three weeks and I am eager, eager. Next week is going to be like, don't miss next week, I'm telling you. But today you're in for a treat. I am so excited for today. Uh, Sylvia is preaching. Come on, can we make some noise for Sylvia really quick? Uh, You might remember her from... uh, Don't come yet, I'll I'll call you in a sec. She's ready to go. (laughs) You might have uh, seen her when we were back online in the summer, she preached and just crushed it. She's gonna do the same today. But I love this woman of God. I love your entire family. Uh, Fun story, one day I was on my way to Superstore. I was getting some food for Rome, I believe Roberta had sent me, and I missed a call. And uh, normally after work hours, I don't don't return calls, I'll, I'll do it the next day. But something prompted me I gotta return this call. So I'm sitting in the superstore parking lot and I I got a voicemail and I I got the number down and I I returned the call and and, and it was Sylvia. And so Sylvia's like, hey, I just wanted to, you know, run run an idea by you. And it was meant to be a quick, like three minute thing. I had this thing I need some help with and it turned into like an hour conversation. And it was just the most, I feel like every conversation I have with you, Sylvia, turns into an hour conversation. But uh, I'm like, Sylvia, I got five minutes and 60 minutes later, we're still chatting and I just love it. But you know, this conversation marked my life because I, we, I hung up the phone and I drove away and I called Roberta. I was like, Roberta, I just had the most life-giving conversation that I've had in months. And I don't even know who I was talking to. It was just the best. She was so encouraging and so full of faith and so inspiring. And now they're dear friends. And uh, Sylvia, I just am so excited for what God is doing in your life. And here you are preaching the word of God. And so what, what, this is something we're gonna do whenever we have a guest in the house. We're gonna give honor where honor is due. We're actually gonna stand to our feet I want to invite you to stand to your feet and make some crazy noise. Clap your hands, shout as we welcome the woman of God to bring the word today. Here is Sylvia. Man, it's so good to be here and and thank you. Thank you. Um, But I'm not a guest. I get to be and I get to call Rose church my home and I want to finish that story I want to or I want to give you the other side of that story and say that after that phone call I actually walked into my husband's office and I said oh wow I have just fallen in love with a pastor (laughs) and true story my husband said you think maybe you should like listen to him preach or something because he could see that I was, I was already in. Um, you guys, we are so blessed to have Mark and Roberta as our pastors, right? Yes, let's give it up for them. You want to talk about a power couple, that's it. They're it. Um, so I am honored to be on team here at Rose and um, <laughs> I am supposed to tell you a little bit about myself. So um, nine to five, I'm a therapist. I am the proud mama of a couple kids and a couple in love children. I have been happily married to my tall, dark, and handsome Paul for 32 years. But okay, this is the part. Okay, you guys are all sitting. This is good. Okay, seven months ago, I became a Nona. I know, I know, it's crazy. It is so good. And then a couple months later, I have a, I have a seven-month-old and I have a four-month-old. So I have two amazing grandbabies. And I'll tell you, this is life-changing and only for the good. It's so amazing. I'm still, I'm still in awe about all of that. So Mark has invited me to be a part of the, okay, I've been practicing. Roberta, I have been practicing. A part of the stronger the stronger, oh man, I had it. It starts with the C. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Voice in the Darkness. Collection, collection, not series, collection. And this morning, I want to talk about joy. Um, some years ago, I went back to university to get my second degree, and uh, I was busing it to and from University of Manitoba. And I'm on my transfer bus downtown. Whole 
slew of buses lined up. And I see this woman, and she is marching towards the row of buses. And there is like this dark cloud around and about her. Everything about her is tight. Her lips are drawn tight. I mean, she had this really crazy, like, perm. And even, it was possible, even her hair looked angry. Everything about her was just not happy. And she boarded my bus and locked eyes with me and marched towards me. I mean, this woman was like she was marching to her own execution. And then she sat beside me, and I said, morning. And she said, well, it is morning. I'll give you that. It's going to be a long bus ride. I got into my book, and uh, I, was, I was reading, and I mean, it was stiff. And it was, she was, lots of, those, you know, <sighs> lots of that going on. And then I thought, wow, this is really going to be a long ride. And then at some point, she got up, and she turned to me. And um, she said, well, as a parent, you can read, so I'm going to leave this with you. And she took a brochure out of her purse, she thrust it on my lap, and without a backward glance, stepped off the bus. And in my hand was this brochure, and it was the four spiritual laws. And on the cover was, Jesus loves you. So I have thought about her a lot over the years. Um, and I don't want us to judge her too harshly this morning because I think that there's, there's definitely some of her in me some days. I look at her and I think, hey, dedication, check. Commitment, check. Um, <laughs> follow through on... On a task, check, check. And she was miserable. I want to talk a little bit about what joy isn't, and then we'll get into what joy is. What joy isn't is joy isn't about our happenings. Happiness. Happiness and joy. Happiness is oh, the bombers won. <laughs> I am happy. <laughs> the bombers, heaven forbid, didn't happen yet this season. They lose. I'm not happy. Happiness. I had a great night's sleep. I'm well rested. Woo! I am happy. I did not sleep well. Lousy sleep. I'm tired. I'm anxious. I'm grumpy. Not happy. Happiness is about happenings, the circumstances outside of our lives. Joy. Joy is an inside job. And I don't want us for a second to vilify happiness. We want to be happy with those that have had good happenings and as we want other people to be happy for us. But how do we tap into joy? The book of Psalms in the Bible, in the Old Testament, one of the largest books in, is full of amazing poems and songs, uh, songs and actually invitations to worship. It is written by or attributed to shepherd boy turned king, David. And it is from this book I want us to look at how David touches on the topic of joy. In Psalm 26, 7, he says, The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him and I am helped. My heart leaps for joy and I will give thanks to him in song. Psalm 34, 8, David again says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. This beautiful, poetic, acrostic verse, it's penned by David when he is literally fleeing for his life. It was created at a time when David is literally running on the heels of King Saul, who has a price on his head, and he's heading to to Gath, which is home of his enemies, the Philistines. They, they, he's not popular. He is hated and despised by the Philistines because he took out their giant Goliath. So he is not welcome there. How bad. 
This is David's life when he's fleeing for his life, moving into the enemy camp, literally. And yet, and yet, again, Psalm 30, 11, David says, You turned my wailing into dancing. You removed my sackcloth, and you clothed me with joy. Wait a minute. What is going on? There is wailing. There is grieving. There is night and darkness. And there is dancing. And there is joy. How is there joy besides sorrow or dancing when things feel heavy? There's darkness. David sheds some light on this. In Psalm 16, he says, You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. In God's presence, and Carly touched on this in worship, and Jono again, is fullness of joy. That's what I call with God joy. It's about somehow connecting and being with him. Now, I don't know about you guys, if you've ever had a really tough moment or a not-so-wonderful, most awesomest ever day of your life, and in that moment, a human offered you a verbal cliche like, Maybe you should just lean in to the joy of the Lord. And I'm thinking, maybe I just want to punch you in the face right now. <laughs> Not helpful, right? I think we can sometimes lose the plot line of God with joy. I could be wrong here, but it seems like we sometimes approach this joy almost in a manic way this all or nothing, and it can come across as inauthentic and desperate. We move into this dangerous zone that psychologist Susan David refers to as toxic positivity. This forced positivity, it's not helpful. It's not good for us. It does not allow us to grow in our with God joy. Ignoring, minimizing, denying, refusing to touch, feel, or deal with our painful stories hurts us emotionally, physically, and spiritually. Toxic positivity is this all or nothing mindset that suggests we must be joyful at the exclusion of being real about some of the hard moments in our lives. In the musical, Book of Mormons, there's this poignant song called Turn It Off. And the lyrics literally suggest, when you're feeling pesky, feelings that just don't seem right, just turn it off like a reading light. It's all or nothing. From not okay to switch it off and it's all good. Except it's not. Toxic positivity is this all or nothing mindset that suggests we must be joyful at the exclusion of acknowledging and holding space for some of the real hard moments in our lives. Growing stronger God joy in our lives is not about ignoring our emotions. The Bible is full of story of men and women who wept, who wailed, who grieved, who ripped their garments in anguish, who cried, who groaned, The Bible even says, moaned, deep moaning, wailing. I suggest that God gets us. And what is so beautiful about David's relationship, 
and the Bible refers to as his friendship with God, was that David does not hesitate to take his dysregulated, distraught self, and he leans into his complete confidence, not in himself, but in God. David has grasped hold of that solid trust that God will meet him intimately in those moments, and yet so all-powerful, so vast, that he can hold all of those emotions of David's even while he is filling him up with his joy. David's life circumstances would have elicited so many tense, painful, raw emotions. He was largely ignored by his family, forgotten actually, literally, by his father, mocked, ridiculed by his brothers. He spent decades fighting and fleeing, literally, for his life, as King Saul purposed to take him out. He experienced the loss of a child. And yet, he says, you will show me the path of life, and in your presence is fullness of joy. Stronger joy, then, comes not from being strong in of ourselves, Yay, right? It does not come from standing up and proclaiming, I'm not hurt, when we're lying in the road and we're bleeding everywhere. No. Joy comes from going to our Heavenly Father again and again, over and over and over and over, with all of our truth and also making room and allowing for what David says in Psalm 16. In your presence, there is a fullness of joy. And going there, going there, tasting and seeing that God is good, experiencing this stronger joy, this amazing inside of us. Life is amazing experience, this joy. Going there, it is not kumbaya easy. It's messy, and it's murky, and it's complicated, because our lives are messy and complicated and beautiful. The invitation to taste and see does not waver in the face of COVID. It does not waver in the face of times of great uncertainty. It doesn't waver when the news is bad. It doesn't waver when the report was so not what we were wanting to hear. It does not waver when our real life behind the scenes is a train wreck. But it's not easy. It invites us It invites us, tasting and seeing, invites us to do the hard thing and to go there and to choose to show up and allow ourselves to be seen and to be heard by God and then allowing him to fill us up. Especially when all we want to do is lay down in the road and not get up. God's invitation to taste and see, to allow him to fill us with joy. Church, it does not blink in the face of our adversity and at times when we're walking through pain. What are some of the things that make God's invitation of experiencing stronger joy hard? The Bible, again, wow, Old and New Testament is full of, of amazing wisdom and insight into some of the things that are joy stealers. Gossip, slander, trash talk and other people, strifing, conflict, fighting with other people and then carrying that offense, those emotions in our bodies. Those are all things that can steal us 
and rob joy from coming into our lives. I want, however, to touch on one aspect that can often withhold joy from us, and it's one that we have so much control over, you guys, and that is our own attachment to our suffering. Dr. Gaber Maté, who wrote a best-selling book in the realm of hungry ghosts, um, is a very learned man. He's a child of Auschwitz, and he actually just launched an amazing documentary on trauma. He has helped literally thousands of individuals and communities heal from their hardships. And he admits that he says, I am very attached to my suffering. And he is now 77 years old, and he is just starting to realize that he can empathize with all of the pain, the heartbreak, the despair, and the injustice that's going on in our world, and also make room for joy. Maybe stronger joy is about and joy. Sometimes we have to let go of our loyalty to pain and our suffering in order to create space to allow some welcome for joy to come in. You know, I'm kind of attached to my pain. I went to university. I got that second degree. And I had a dream job picked. Ooh, I'm telling you, every time I drove by the head office of the agency that I was going to work for, I would just be speaking it. I'd be declaring it. This is exciting. That's where I'm going. That's what I'm working for. This is so good. So good. A job offer came available. I sent in my resume. They called me back. I had an interview. And I didn't get the job. And I was gutted. And it was about two nights later. My family is all in bed. And I am sitting in the office. And I am devastated. And I am, I'm gutted. And I'm moving. There's that fine line from discouragement into full-on despair. What did I miss? What do I do now? This feels like such a failure. Wow. Oh. And I feel... Holy Spirit, and Jono alluded to this miracle that we're in right now and the Holy Spirit being present. Yeah, Holy Spirit, God, Jesus, Holy Spirit. Jesus actually talks about the Holy Spirit in the Gospel of John, the 14th, the 16th chapter, but he talks about how I'm going to send one greater. He's going to be a comforter, a teacher, a guider, a counselor. Yeah? And from the inside in that moment felt the Holy Spirit say, hey, you want to be part of a joy party? Not going to lie. My response was, no, no, I do not. Oh, no, no. Holy Spirit is like grinning, grinning at me. I'm like, I got a good wallow going on here. I did not get the job. I do not know what's coming up next. There is a huge life sucks right now theme going on and you want me to enter a joy party. And he just kept grinning. And I got quiet. And God's presence filled that room. And it filled me. And in that moment, nothing changed and everything changed changed. There was such joy. And it was bizarre because the me, the, the human aspect of me was like, what are you guys getting so excited about? And it was infectious. It was infectious. And there was this incredible awe. Nothing changed and everything changed. And you know what? 
It was not about seeking his hand. It was about experiencing the heart of God in your presence is fullness of joy. David unpacks it even further. In Psalm 8, the third verse, he says, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? Coming into God's presence invites us, hallelujah, to get our eyes off of ourselves and to take a deep, restorative breath and acknowledge that we are in relationship with a God who is so much more vast than the sum total of ourselves and our circumstances. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars, what am I? What am I that you consider me? That all of this, and yet, you desire intimate connection with me. Quickly then, what are some ways that we can lean into joy with our creator? There are so many. There are so many, you guys, but I want to touch on two this morning. So anytime, anytime the Bible says something a few times, he repeats, it's like, I'm okay, I'm listening, I'm listening. You know how your parents, right, a few times, don't leave the house, make sure you got clean drawers on, right? How many of it? Okay, all right, you keep repeating it. This must be important. Well, how about in the Old Testament, a hundred and two times, and in the New Testament, this is said 72 times, 174 times at least that we know of, that the Bible talks about giving thanks and having gratitude. Gratitude, gratefulness, thankfulness is the doorway of which joy walks through. It is the preparation. Long before Alex Korb, the neuroscientist, ever wrote his best-selling book, The Upward Spiral, Long before he scientifically explained to you and me how when we are grateful, when we show gratitude, it changes the wiring in our brain. It increases the good hormones like serotonin and dopamine and oxytocin to flood our bodies. Long before the mental health community said, oh, ooh, gratefulness is a wonderful, wonderful tool in building mental health, long before the self-help community jumped on book after book after book. Journal, oh, there's amazing gratitude journals out there, you guys, amazing. But long before this big sweep, God created us. And he created us with the spirit of gratitude, not because he keeps score or he's wanting us to jump through hoops, but because it is how we can experience his joy fully to live in a spirit of gratitude. So, so paramount, so key to joy, to stronger joy. And the second aspect that can help us grab hold, you guys, I believe that every single day, God gives us gifts of joy, every single day, the problem is that we don't see them. We're, we don't, we're not mindful enough. We're not looking. We walk by them every day. And really, David sheds light on it when he says, taste and see that the Lord is good. That's two out of the five senses. Taste, touch, smell, listen. Experiencing joy is about opening up our senses and being able to connect with the work of his hands that is around us, and it's free, and it's available. There is a huge movement now. One of the biggest kind of cutting-edge pieces in the mental health world is how we absolutely are 
healthier and more vibrant when we connect with nature. Florence Williams' best-selling book, The Nature Fix, it, it backs up data after data. South Korea, Japan, they're way ahead of us here in the West, but talking about just getting out, looking at sky and earth and rock and water and giving thanks. Our blood pressure goes down. Our good hormones again flood our bodies. We are healthier. Part of experiencing God's joy is being open and aware to the gifts he gives us every day in the moon, in a sunset, in a sunrise. Helen Keller said, it is not the senses that I have, but such that I do with them. Therein lies my kingdom. Wow. Coming from someone who was both deaf and blind, therein lies my kingdom. Couldn't see, couldn't hear, but she opened up her kingdom with touch. And it began to connect her to people, to her creator, to his goodness. Anytime, anytime Jesus was doing miracles in the Bible, he invites our participation. Get up and walk. Go to the river. Dip into the river. Place this mud on your eyes. He invites participation. And one of the ways for us to experience deeper joy is there has to be action. There has to be movement. Participation in that. Tasting and seeing. Dancing and singing involve the action. To enjoy the gifts that God offers, we got to do our part. I love that Roberta, in her message last week, she talked about discipline, and sometimes it's hard. But we get to pick our hard, and I would rather pick joy hard than dismay hard. So some of you might be asking, Sylvia, you're talking about dancing. You're talking about rejoicing and singing and you know what, I'm still lying down in the road right now. I want to acknowledge you this morning, and I want to celebrate your 10%. I want to celebrate your 40% or your 90 or your 100%, wherever you are at. You know what, you didn't need to tune in this morning. You could have thrown the duvet over your head and just kept right on sleeping. But you didn't. You tuned in, and so we celebrate that. We celebrate that step. Some of you didn't want to come here this morning, but you did. You booked a seat. You drove on down, maybe on your day off, and here you are, and we celebrate that. We celebrate that as an act, as a movement towards ushering in God with joy in our lives this morning, wherever you're at this morning. We just want to celebrate, and I want to encourage you. Taste and see that God is good. So whether today your toe is just tapping or you got the moves Mick Jagger, we just celebrate you and this moment. Amen. <laughs>